So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Rajesh Merchandani, the Vice President of Communications and Policy Outreach here at the Centre, and I'm delighted to welcome you all uh, this afternoon to our event, Innovation in Development, Why Are We Not Getting to Scale? Let me step back a few, uh, a few steps, a few years. For 15 years now, CGD has been innovating, as you can tell by our clever logo. This is our 15th anniversary. And for those 15 years, we've been coming up with new policy ideas to make the world fairer and more prosperous for all. Uh, one of the things we increasingly talk about is innovation in itself. Development depends on innovation, new ideas, new funding mechanisms, new technologies that save and improve lives, from vaccines to solar lamps to development impact bonds. But even if those innovations reach a million people, many of them still fall short of getting to the billion that still live in poverty. How do we know when an innovation is ready to scale and how do we scale it to the size of the problem? How do we make innovative solutions financially sustainable? How do we roll out a successful idea across countries when no two countries' conditions are the same? Can scale be left entirely to the market? What is the role of aid agencies and governments in innovating to scale? These are some of the questions we'll be asking today with our panel of innovators and experts. We'll be discussing the challenges and exploring the opportunities to do better in harnessing innovation for development. To begin with, I'm going to take a little bit of poetic license. I'm going to create a word. I'm going to create the word futurize. Some of you think that word already exists. It actually doesn't. Um, but if anyone has that word in their remit, it's Anne May Chang, our keynote speaker. As Chief Innovation Officer and Executive Director of the US Global Development Lab, it's her job to futurize US development efforts to try and reach that billion. So how's that going? Let's hear about some of the challenges and solutions as I invite Anne May to come up to the podium and make some keynote remarks, a short presentation, and then we'll begin the discussion after that. Anne May, welcome. Thank you, um, and welcome. Good afternoon. So, great introduction, Rajiv, um, Rajesh. In the past few decades, we've seen how innovation can make a dramatic impact in global development. We've seen interventions like oral rehydration therapy and microfinance improve hundreds of millions of lives. And as the world's problems only become more and more complex, innovation is going to be even more important. But it's only going to matter if we can take those innovations to scale. We need to let go of, the I of this myth that all it takes is a great idea. Of the thousands of development innovations that are out there, precious few have reached millions, let alone tens or hundreds of millions. Some of this is expected. Failure is a natural and healthy part of innovation. But too often, we're seeing solutions that have been proven to work get bogged down and hit a ceiling. This map represents just a small microcosm of the problem. It shows just a tiny subset of innovations, in this case, mobile health interventions in Uganda. Yet each of these was targeting a particular disease in a particular locality, and there were so many of these happening in different pockets in Uganda that the Ministry of Health actually called a moratorium, essentially saying, stop the insanity. Thomas Edison once said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. And I believe this is equally true when it comes to innovation. When it comes to innovation and global development, we have a tendency to focus too much on these new ideas, that 1% that that's sexy and fun. But to truly achieve impact, we need to focus more on that perspiration, the long, hard slog to take an innovation to scale. So what do, you hear, what do you hear most often is the greatest barrier to getting innovations to scale and development? If you're like me, funding is what most people say. And it's true. Securing funding is hard. Yet I'd argue that funding is not the core problem. In fact, too often we see innovators get distracted while chasing funding or trying to scale too soon. This may be a little controversial, but I believe that if you have solid business fundamentals, the funding will be there. So today, I want to share three of those that I think are the most critical. 
The first I want to start with is user demand. Even if an innovation can dramatically improve lives, the intended user might not actually see it that way. It can take a concerted effort to build user demand and awareness for a new product or new service. Even with oral rehydration therapy, which reached hundreds of millions, it wasn't simple. It took long, hard work, including simplifying the formula, a massive door-to-door -door ca education campaign, and large-scale promotion and distribution. One example of an innovator we've been working with on this front is Baba Job, which is a platform that connects the informal sector workers in India with better job opportunities. They found users through bus ads, through billboards, and even printed ads on teacups. But they found they had a hard time attracting users who had low rates of literacy. So with a grant from USAID, they've created an interactive voice response, or IVR, platform so that people can access their services using just a basic mobile phone and through voice. With this, more than 800,000 offline job seekers have now joined Baba Job through their IVR system, and it's growing rapidly. So it's just taken them retooling their interface to meet where the users are. The second barrier I want to talk about is what I think is the biggest, and that's financial sustainability. Too often, we find that innovators don't have a plan for long-term financial sustainability. We know that grant or impact funding eventually comes to an end. But solutions should live on. Successful innovations need to identify an engine that will continue to fuel their growth, whether that be market-driven, government adoption, or some hybrid. Whatever the mechanism, they need to find a way to generate ongoing revenue to fund expansion to new customers, new channels, and new markets. One social enterprise that figured this out is Off-Grid Electric in Tanzania. Solar power is an ideal solution to provide energy to poor rural households that live off the electrical grid. Yet the upfront costs put home solar systems out of reach for many of these families. Off-Grid overcame this barrier by developing a new business model using mobile payments to allow families to be able to pay off their solar systems at just a few cents a day, often less than they were spending on kerosene. What this means is that Off-Grid is able to make a profit, and they can plow that money back into serving more customers. Off-Grid has now powered more than 100,000 households and is aiming to reach a million by the end of next year. So the last barrier I want to talk about is operational maturity. The reality is that the people and the structures that generate the best ideas are often not the same ones that are best equipped to take them to scale. It just fundamentally often requests, requires a different set of skills. In fact, a Harvard Business School study called The Founder's Dilemma found that less than a quarter of founders were still leading their companies when they went public. As this shows, founders face a tough choice to stay in control and potentially limit their growth or impact, or to bring in expertise that's necessary to realize their idea's full potential. This was echoed in a recent Shell Foundation report on social enterprises, which noted, quote, the single largest, the single largest cause of failure occurs when management teams lack the necessary business skills and competencies. What this means is potentially merging or partnering with a larger organization, bringing in experienced executives, or even hiring a CEO and stepping into a founder's role. So one example of this is uh, something called the Odon device, which is a low-cost medical device used for obstructed births that has the potential to be safer and easier to use than forceps, and thus save lots of newborn lives. The inventor turns out to be an Argentinian car mechanic. And he recognized that he didn't have the expertise to, design, to develop and manufacture this new device. So what he did was he licensed it to Becton Dickinson, a major medical device company 
that's now testing and developing the device in collaboration with the World Health Organization. And so Odon said that it felt like taking my child to university so that it may grow and achieve what I have long dreamed. It's too rare that our innovations in development take that leap to partner, to hand off their innovations to people or structures that can enable them to scale. So I'm going to end there and say that scaling innovations is hard, but I believe it's possible. For innovators, it requires perspiration, grit, and enough humility to know when you need help. For donors, it requires the discipline to focus on building demand and long-term financial sustainability rather than just looking for those quick wins. So I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Anne May. I'm going to introduce your co-panelists and invite you all to come up to the stage as I do so. Uh, Sonal Shah is the Executive Director of the Beak Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown University and formerly Director of the Office of Social Innovation and Civic Partnership at the White House. She also headed up Google's philanthropic arm as well. Michael Fay is the co-founder of Give Directly and Segovia, a platform that allows members of the public to donate money to people directly in developing countries. They have so far raised $105 million and signed up 34,000 households. And Charles Kenny, our very own senior fellow here at CGD, a colleague and friend, and author of a recent paper, Donors Funding Technology, 10 Recommendations. I have a feeling we might hear some of those during the course of the conversation. Welcome, everybody. It's great to have you all here. Um, Anne May, thank you very much for your comments. Let me start with you. Um, you, you gave us some examples there. Baba Job in India, Off Grid. Uh, I didn't note down where Off Grid was. Tanzania. Tanzania. And you said that Off Grid had reached 100,000 so far. Um, I'm keen to know, you know, what exactly do you mean by scale? When do you know you've reached scale? Yeah, so I, d I define scale as uh, relative to the size of the problem. So if we're talking about ending extreme poverty, depending on which benchmark you use, it's somewhere around a billion people. And that means we have to reach some significant subset of that billion people. And that doesn't mean necessarily one specific enterprise, but it could be you know, um, through replication and otherwise multiple different enterprises, multiple different interventions by governments that reach that scale. Um, similar to what microfinance and oral rehydration therapy have done. And so um, when we look at something like off-grid electric, what we're seeing is a trajectory that off-grid itself may be able to reach you know, a million by the end of next year, maybe 10 million over time. But what's exciting about this sector is we're also seeing something like five other companies at a comparable level of scale that are also reaching their own sort of on track to reach their own million plus um, users. and that. Through that and through replicating that model, there's a potential to get to the hundreds of millions we're seeking. Now, you, as well as Sonal, have uh, a lot of experience in Silicon Valley. What's different? How do you think differently about scaling innovation uh, now you're in international development than in Silicon Valley or in the private sector? Well, I think there's two sides, two answers to that question. So one is that I just don't think we're ambitious enough when we talk about scale when it comes to development. I think we often think of a million people as massive scale. Um, and like I said, I think, the, the, and as you said, the scale of the problem is usually closer to a billion, not a million. That's like three orders of magnitude more. Um, so I think we need to be more ambitious about what we should be shooting for. And Silicon Valley is certainly very ambitious and wanting to reach the billions of people. So I think that's the first step. Um, scale is also much more difficult in developing countries, right? The, if, you know, it's much harder to have a financially sustainable business model because people have less money. You're serving people who are poor. Um, you know, governments are not um, are as wealthy and certainly are not as, um, don't have as much capacity as, as our government does. And so it's, there's, and, you know, there's innumerable challenges of fragile states, you know, instability and so forth. So it's much harder, but I think we need to be equally ambitious. Michael, you're an entrepreneur. In her presentation, Anne May was saying that entrepreneurs are often not the best people to take their innovations to scale. <laughs> so let's get your response to that first of all. <laughs> um, and then let's talk a little bit about your approach to, to, to innovating, which is to basically let the market scale up for you. Talk a little bit through that. I suppose this is as good a time as any to announce my retirement. <laughs> uh, um, Look, I, I think it depends. I think we have lots of examples of founders that have gone on to be great CEOs 
Um, Facebook, Google still have their founders leading the companies. Uh, largely, there are many others, Uber and so on. I, I think it depends. I, I don't know if there's a one solution fits all on that question. Um, your second question was on kind of how do you achieve scale? Yeah, what are the kind of you know, obstacles for you? How is it going for you? And you also know, is the market the best way to do it? So I, I really like Anne May's first point, which is scale starts with demand. Somebody needs to buy the product that you're selling. Crystal Pepsi didn't fail to scale because of a lack of capital. It failed to scale because nobody wanted it. Um, but what I think we often miss is who the consumer is in a lot of development interventions. Uh, the reality is that the donor, whether it's a philanthropic individual, uh, an aid agency like DFID or USAID, uh, or a government, which tends to be the biggest purchaser of a lot of development services, are ultimately the consumer. And the reason they're the consumer is because it's philanthropy or aid. If the consumer could buy it at a rate of return that was justified in the market, private capital would come in. So there's some implicit subsidy which means that the donor is the buyer. The unique thing about a lot of development interventions is that the person that benefits the beneficiary is not the person that pays the donor. Uh, that's different than the normal commercial markets. You are the user of the iPhone and you purchase the iPhone. So what does that mean? I think what it means is that the donor needs to be very clear on what they're buying and why they're buying it. What are the buying criteria? What are the decision factors that lead them to buy something. Hopefully they align with what the user would want. Um, but I think too often when you look at kind of the large procurement contracts, two things happen. One is um, there is a bit of a passing the torch where there's a lot of capital up front for innovation or initial ca catalytic investment. But then you look around and you say, well, who's gonna buy this? And everyone looks around because I think there's more catalytic capital than there is for paying for the actual intervention longer term. So one, I'd like to change that and have people and donors be more willing to actually pay for the intervention. Um, and the second thing is a real clarity on what those decision factors are. I think we talk a lot about evidence. So USAID launched a bit ago development innovation ventures, a real focus on evidence. Now, wouldn't it be great if the procurement process and the contracting locally ask the simple question of what evidence, what randomized evidence is there of impact? And I think when you get into the real weeds of that, one, it's often unclear what the factors are that you're buying or paying for services is. But when it is clear, it often tends to be at the organizational level. How long have you existed in this region? Well, that actually favors the incumbent and pushes against innovation and change. So I think when we think about scaling, we need to actually get into the kind of nitty gritty of procurement and whatnot. So no, let's pick up that point with you. I mean, you've said this before in different fora. Um, I mean, Michael's hinting at this, that the issue with development is about paying for outputs rather than outcomes, in a way. Talk us a little bit about that and how that impacts scale. Yeah, I, I think we don't actually have a conversation around outcomes. We have a conversation about evidence. Is your evidence better than my evidence? Do we have the right metrics? Um, but I don't always know that we actually talk about what outcome we're actually trying to achieve. And that's hard. It's a hard conversation because if you're doing a public-private partnership, both of you actually have to talk about the exact same thing. It can't be, I want to solve poverty. It's got to be, what exactly are we trying to solve in that? And we end up talking about, it gets down to metrics. But let me give you an example of why I think this is interesting and how governments do this. Um, the government of New Zealand is procuring on outcomes. And an example of how they're doing it is actually quite interesting. There's a public-private partnership on jails. How many of you know how jails are worked in the United States or anywhere? It's like a, it's basically, it's a build, own, operate. So whoever builds it also operates a jail. In the United States, in New Zealand, frankly, most places around the world where it's a public-private partnership. New Zealand decided that they were gonna, the jail that they were funding, the contractor who was doing that is gonna get paid bonus payments on, recidiv on the reduction of recidivism. Now, the person who's doing that and who's building it has to now design a jail and build a jail with the, with the idea of how do you reduce recidivism. And that's a whole different incentive structure. And his point was, 
I have to look at risk factors differently. So it gets to data. I'm now collecting different data than I was collecting, which is how many people are in jail? What's the cost per bed? How cheap can we make it on the cost per bed? How many people are not fighting? Now you're talking about how many people are not coming back. So the design of this jail in New Zealand is all about getting people out. The second is you talk to the wardens and like we have to rethink our job because our job was to keep people protected, but now we're thinking about how do we help people not come back in jail. So it's an example, it's not really the only one, but it's, it's really this conversation around what is outcomes. The government is the largest procurer of social services. If we were to rethink even in 1% from an outcomes perspective, which is how many people going to the hospital, Affordable Care Act is doing this with healthcare, how many people in a hospital don't come back because they're healthier, as opposed to um, they come back for treatment every single time, but it requires a depth of conversation about what it is we're actually trying to do, and then changing the incentive structures to actually make that happen. So government can be a part of the scale, the private sector certainly can be a part of the scale, but I, I think we have to have a depth of conversation on what is an outcome, how are we going to change the whole system, not just one program. Um, what we do in the US is we do discretionary dollars, so we don't actually have to get to mandatory which is where the billions of dollars are. And like, how about if we were using the mandatory dollars on outcomes and paying for it and changing the incentive structures, changing the procurement system, um, changing the payment systems and the way we would pay for people, what would that look like that is different than what it is, um, than what we do now, which is number of services rendered? <coughs> Charles Kenny, let's bring you in here. Um, the paper you recently wrote on technology and development, 10 recommendations uh, for donors, um, I wonder if you can just kind of just tell us a little bit about it. <laughs> plug it. Go on, plug it. I'm giving you a, a platform here to plug it. Um, <laughs> but also tell us how you, you take what you wrote there and you apply it to this conversation about innovation and picking up on what Sonal talked about, the role of government. So it's a paper. It's got 10 recommendations about what donors ought to do around innovation um, technology. Uh, but uh, the, one of the sort of central points is about an issue that CGD researchers have thought a lot about, uh, which is external validity. So you know that you can do the best evaluation of a project in a particular environment in a developing country or in the United States and discover it works. And then say, right, well, now we know it works. We're going to scale it up um, and think that you're done when <laughs> the evidence suggests, certainly for particular kinds of innovation, that's a really dangerous approach to take mm -hmm. because when you change the environment in which this innovation is taking place, the results may change. Uh, my, my colleague Justin Sandifer uh, wrote a paper a few years ago on an experiment in Tanzania where a local NGO was, sorry, an NGO was hired to um, uh, uh, bring in contract teachers to support uh, teaching uh, in, in Tanzania. Um, it worked to improve learning outcomes, actual outcomes, mm -hmm. thank goodness they were measuring outcomes, uh, learning outcomes uh, uh, when it was done by the NGO on a small scale uh, uh, in a particular area of Tanzania. When they scaled it up, they scaled it up in two different ways. One was it was scaled up in parts of the country by the NGO and in other parts of the country it was scaled up by the government of Tanzania. When it was scaled up by the NGO actually it kept on working. Mm -hmm. So same intervention, same intervener, um, same result. But when it was scaled up and the government took over, for various reasons it stopped working. And indeed, in the end, uh, all of these contract teachers were hired as uh, uh, full-time salaried staff of, uh, of the uh, Tanzanian uh, uh, government. And the returns per teacher, salaried government teacher in Tanzania are fairly low. So it really didn't have very much of an impact at all. If anything, it had a negative impact. Um, so we really have to think about not just scaling up uh, the intervention, but scaling up the evaluation to make sure that when we go through the necessary change of going from something that's small and pilot to something that, that is big and getting towards the billions, we don't sort of leave the evaluation behind, if you will. And that's going to be more true of some kind of innovations than others. Vaccines work pretty much on people the world over pretty much the same way. So if there is a lot of a disease in a place and you've got a vaccine that works, probably it's gonna work the same across all those people in all those places with a disease. The more you get into in innovations that involve uh, 
social relations, the institutions of government, and so on. The more likely it is you change the environment, you'll change the results. And the more we have to think about scaling evaluation. And the way you scale evaluation is rather than having a bespoke survey just before you start your innovation, and then another bespoke survey six months after you've started your innovation, and then another bespoke survey a year or two after that to see how it works in this particular village, and thinking of doing that again when you go to scale in 800 villages, we start moving towards a data system at the country level that allows this to happen sort of just regularly. That, so when it comes to education interventions, for example, if actually we started having testing systems running regularly in developing countries and rich countries alike, uh, uh, that allowed us to know, you know how students were doing in each school each six months, each year, then we could test an innovation in some of those schools and use that regular process to evaluate it, and see if it's, it's working at the pilot level and then when we scale it up. We really, the, 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 the bespoke evaluation system is great for pilots and we should do more pilots and we should do more bespoke evaluations. But in order to get to this scale issue and make sure that we're still delivering income, um, impacts when we deliver it to scale, we've got to get beyond bespoke to sort of wholesale, if you will. Mm -hmm. and, and how's that going to uh, disrupt the system in terms of how contracts are awarded or how uh, uh, agencies see implementers? If you're doing routine evaluations and you end up with an evaluation that's routinely bad, then that's going to speak to some of the issues you were talking about, about long contracts. I think, Isn't I mean, it? I think it's it going goes, to challenge goes, those vested interests. It does go back to the procurement issue. This is one way to make procuring around results far more straightforward. I mean, one of the the big challenge of procuring around results, once you've figured out what you want the result to be, yeah. is measuring that result and measuring it in a way that you know is believable and robust. And that's a challenge, sort of way beyond the aid industry, right? That's a that's that's a challenge for all of us. Uh, uh, rich governments, poor governments, uh, everybody, um, is making it much easier to discover whether we are getting the results that we're paying for. We should be doing that you know, as a matter of course. It just happens to apply particularly to the area of innovation. And mate, the things that we've heard talked about, being clear, more clear about who is buying what, paying for outcomes, routine evaluations, how do those things, how do those evaluations, or uh, sorry, how do those uh, uh, factors fit into the kind of framework that you set out in your comments. I mean, you kind of laid out those three obstacles to scale, creating user demand, financial stability, and operational maturity. But the things we're hearing are somewhat different. How, yeah, do, they, how do you reconcile those? Well, so the, the three barriers that I talked about were more from the innovator standpoint. Um, and and uh, I think what we're talking about here is what the role donors can play. And I completely agree with what's been said here that I think ultimately the holy grail is for us to pay for outcomes. It's the most um, efficient and effective way for government to be able to get exactly what we want to pay for and only pay if we accomplish it. Um, and it's a great way to incentivize innovation because you know, two, uh, we're actually p providing the right incentives for innovations to deliver better, more cost-effective results rather than innovation for innovation's sake, which is what I think too many of our programs end up um, cultivating. And so I completely agree with this. Um, I would say that, you know, one of the things we're trying to do in the Global Development Lab is really to turn upside down the way that we do development. You know, the, the ultimate goal in my mind is absolutely pay for outcomes, but I think it's going to take a lot of work for us to get there structurally, institutionally, and so forth. And so along the way, we're trying, trying to take some steps. And we're trying to put together a model that we call 21st century development. So if you look at the current default way that governments procure, we tend to design a program behind our walls, kind of throw an RFA and RFP over the wall, get some dozen or so proposals from largely large multinationals, and then pick one that we think is the solution and do that for three to five years. That's sort of the structure of the way programs work. We don't believe that that's the most effective way to incentivize results or innovation. And so what we're trying to do is really create a very different structure that's more open, more data-driven, more agile, and more scalable.
So it looks more like at the front end that we co-create and we design with users and communities and stakeholders that understand the problem. That rather than pick one solution, we pick many solutions that have potential and we test them and iterate, improve them and see which ones then show the evidence of reaching the outcomes we look for and then really invest in bringing those to scale and finding those financially sustainable paths so that they can live on well beyond a sort of five-year horizon or a program. And so it's a very different structure for development that we're trying to move to from a donor perspective, and that will also take a long time, but I think will support the kinds of things being talked about here. Uh, and what are the kind of successes of that or the challenges of that that you're facing, although you've seen? <laughs> Um, certainly, you know, changing the structure of how we've traditionally procured things is very challenging in government. So what we're doing is taking baby steps. Um, we're trying to put pieces of this in action. As Michael mentioned, we have a program called Development Innovation Ventures that is modeled after the venture capital model where we do tiered evidence-based funding of innovations. Right, so you might have a new idea that we give a $100,000 grant to to test out and see if it works. And you know, if it seems to show promise, we give a million dollar grant where we um, are really trying to build out more infrastructure to and test it further and build more evidence. And then if that shows continued promise, then we might give a $5 million grant to really uh, help bring it to greater scale. And so it's a very different tiered model. And so we're testing a lot of these models. We're building up the evidence base to show that they work. Um, and then I think with evidence that this new model development can be more effective, can yield uh, better results more quickly, the hope is to move more and more of the way we procure over to incorporating elements of this over time into our default procurement mechanisms. I only want to add to this because I think that, I think that what they're doing and what, what I always worry about is between transitions of governments, we don't actually think about investing in those things that got started that are worth investing in. Innovation is scary. It's scary for everyone that's been in those jobs for a long time, including for myself. Um, but the fact is we need new ideas constantly to know where the world is going and where the users are, where the people are. And it's, it's a dramatically changing world. If it's dramatically changing in the United States, just imagine where it is. I mean, Charles, I know you do, uh, you've done climate stuff before. I mean, we're going to change risk models about climate to, to adaptation and not mitigation. Every risk model in the world is totally focused on mitigation. That is a dramatic change that we are not prepared for. So innovation requires us to be investing in the global development lab ideas more often than not. But it also requires two other things in my view. One, investing in the data infrastructure. So who is capturing that information within USAID for whoever comes next to make sure we're capturing what's working, what's not working, when should we be investing, not just waiting for the next person to figure out the exact same things because the US government dies on pilots. We do millions and millions of pilots and we don't invest on scale. So let's figure out how we're gonna take some of those things that worked before and invest in the scale of that. And then third, train people. You know, the one thing I find with funders that's always fascinating and not necessarily US government, but is like, we don't train our staff. We talk about innovation and then we're like, we don't have anybody to do it because we don't invest in that training. And we're not investing in people learning the new tools and figuring out the way we're doing it. And no foundation that I have seen today is willing to train government, but boy, they're willing to train the private sector. So, and then we have this conversation of, cause, well, of course the private sector is better than government because they get the training and we don't provide that same training to the same staff who is during procurement and has been doing it for the last 20 years, but they have no idea what you're talking about from the policymaker to the procurement person, which is a civil service staff. So that challenge, if we want to really change and have scale, we're going to have to invest in people, and we're not investing in people. We can't just invest in new innovators. We have to invest in people within government that can make that change happen. Do, do you see those problems that she's talking about, Anne May? And why do they exist? Why do, do you see the problems that Sonal is talking about in, in your day-to-day -day work? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that um, you know, Sonal and I have, have talked a lot about this, that we, we are too focused, not only in government, but many donors on innovation for innovation's sake. You know, there's, there's way too much money, as Michael said, for those early stage pilots and not enough investment and focus on how do we really bring things to scale? Because it's not as sexy to get your 
you know, 100,000th and 110,000th customer and 200,000th customer as it is to get your first thousand customers. You don't have a new story to tell. It's not dramatically different. Um, and so there is too much focus, I think, on that front end, too much of that kind of proliferation of innovations and not enough on the real nitty gritty of that 99% we talk about, that perspiration to really take things to scale. Can I just, just on that, I mean, there is a, a question of what the role for aid is when it comes to really scaling up to the billion. Um, and there has, in nearly all cases, there has to be a handover, and that is for the very simple reason that the GDP of the developing world <coughs> and the GDP of a developed world is about the same nowadays, and the developed world hands over about 0.2 or 0.3% of its GDP to the developing world each year, which means that about 0.2 to 0.3% of developing world GDP is related to aid. Um, uh, the, the, the vehicle that can scale up innovations is rarely going to, in developing countries, is rarely going to be an aid agency. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And so this go, comes back to Amé's earlier point about, OK, so what are innovators thinking about how to scale? And there are, frankly, two obvious options. One is the private sector in the developing world, and the other is the government in the developing world. And I think it's a role for aid agencies to help innovators through that process of, mm -hmm. of working with government and working with the private sector. And I'd say, in particular, working with government. Because if it's working with the private sector, there are a bunch of people out there who are well motivated to make a profit. Um, and you know, to some extent, if, if you've developed a, uh, uh, an item and, and got it all the way through, the, the, at least at the pilot level, you know lots of people want to buy it, um, quite likely you will find partners to help you sell more of it if you give them some of the money. Um, when it comes to double disadvantaged technologies in particular, uh, technologies that are aimed at consumers or at least people in developing countries who are poor and aimed at public goods, i.e. the market will not provide them alone. I think there's a real role for donors to help um, through the process of getting government clients in developing countries uh, to come on board and actually want to provide these services themselves. So I'll play devil's advocate a bit oh, for the sake of uh, debate. Uh, so you're, I, I agree completely. The, Government budgets for social spend far trumps development assistance, absolutely. But I often see that used as an excuse mm -hmm. to not have those innovations <laughs> scaled through the donors. And on the ground, the governments look at what the donor governments are doing and look at the interventions. And if the interventions and channels and mechanisms are the same things that we've been doing for 30, 40 years that aren't working, how can we then turn to the government and say, well, you innovate? Um, it's our job, I say our because we're in DC, as a, as a donor community largely, to take the next step. There is something between a pilot at $100,000 and a government program at a billion. And when you look at where GiveDirectly is, for example, so last year we exceeded 50 million in revenue. I forget the exact stat, but I think it's less than 200 organizations in the last few decades, 200 nonprofits have surpassed the 50 million threshold. So there's a large gap between kind of the Pakistani cash transfer program, which is a billion dollars a year, and 50 million. And there's, the donors can play not only, not only have that direct impact of let's say take it to 500 million a year, but also lead the way for donors, to, uh, sorry, the uh, local governments to follow. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. I, I must be on the side of the devil. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I completely agree with you, Charles, that the, the role of donors, I think, is more and more, and I agree with you too, Michael, that is more and more to be catalytic. I think that we need to rethink about what we're trying to do as donor, not as the primary provision, but to be catalytic in getting the private sector and governments to take these things forward, sometimes in collaboration with each other. So in the example I gave about off-grid, what was interesting for us there, and such a good example of the role that we ideally want to play, is that we gave that first $100,000 grant to test out a business model that was too risky for private sector to really take on at the time. And so as the business model is proven, 
we've been able to work with them to scale up, and now we're working with them to transition over to private sector funding. So we've now in some given um, off-grid electric about $6 million worth of funding. And they've, through that, been able to bring in almost $100 million of private sector debt and equity about split evenly. And so they're well on their way to transition to private sector funding. We do the same thing on the government side. And I think, um, so another example is a DIV program in Zambia where um, we worked through um, IPA, an NGO in, um, that worked with the government of Zambia who was, was trying to expand its healthcare worker um, staff, uh, community healthcare workers. And uh, IPA did a, some randomized control trials to figure out what's the most effective way to recruit community healthcare workers. Is it by offering them uh, you know, professional growth opportunities and good salaries and like talking about you know, the professional aspects of this? Or is it about telling them that they could do good for their community? It turned out the, the first, the professional aspect of it, those people did 30% better in terms of their overall productivity and contributions. And so the government was able to adopt that into their model of how they're recruiting their healthcare workers. Um, and so now it's sort of, again, scaling through government. But I think the critical piece that gets missing often here is the bridge. That too often we find innovations or innovators come up with things because they personally saw something that they get intrigued by that they feel like they can make a difference by, but it's not something that government's funding or is prioritized by government. You know, or, or same thing in the private sector. We have something that we think is really good for people, but it's not something that they want to buy. So we need to, I think, connect those dots a little bit more on both sides. But absolutely, I think the role of donors should primarily be to be catalytic in helping to bridge that gap and bring them to some sort of sustainable business model, either through private sector or government or both. Yeah, I, th I think we all agree. agree. And I, I think your example is perfect. We've been very fortunate with a lot of this catalytic funding from Development Innovation fund, uh, Ventures, Global Innovation Fund, um, and so on. And I think the question is, how do you take those pockets of innovation funding? Because they really are for innovation and piloting and testing. And then make sure that this bigger pocket, the $100 million three-year program, that still, procurement still looks like the RFA, RFP, that still looks like business as usual. How do we take everything we're learning from what works here in that innovation bucket and make sure that bigger bucket, the $100 million programs, reflects it? And I think that transition is the hard transition that we're all struggling with at some level. That's what I go to work every day to try and I do. I so I'm glad. <laughs> That's... Well, and the other, the, the, um, the corollary to that is uh, the other thing that the government has the ability to do is crowd in funding. So um, to your point right. about off-grid, which is how do you bring the private sector to the table? And what's the risk that the government can take in order for the private sector uh, to minimize some amount of risk but for the private sector to take on um, more of the funding models? And I don't know that we leverage that as much as we should. I know y'all are doing much more of it. But how do you bring the private sector to the table that allows them to start doing more of this and frankly finding other models that might not be the exact model that you initially financed uh, to do that. And it's going to take that for scale to happen, which is taking it off and giving it to somebody else to fund. And it's not the foundations only, but it needs to be private capital markets. And that makes, I know it makes a lot of people uncomfortable to think about privatizing um, whatever the social sector is, but at some point we need both. We need the, the social sector models that probably need to be funded by government, but also what can the private sector do um, with the right incentives set in place to make that happen? Go on, Michael. Oh, I, I, I totally agree with that, and I think, so I've started these, the two ventures, and one of them is a for-profit company that's raised private capital, and I think with, with the private markets, the private markets will respond to um, how well the business is doing. You'll raise more capital if there are people buying your product. Uh, and if your product is a service that makes the lives of poor better, whether it's off-grid or something else, you'll have absolutely no problem raising private capital. But this comes back to the consumer. So for example, Segovia um, sells technology to NGOs, to governments to help improve their programming. As long as we continue to sell and the NGOs continue to want to buy it to improve their programming, we'll have no problem raising private capital. But if the demand isn't there, so for example, if there is no reward for having data security, if there's no reward for improving financial inclusion, for lowering cost, because actually a lot of the incentives in the system are to have higher cost yeah. on the field because then you have higher overhead back to headquarters. So if you offer a solution that helps the local NGO cut cost, that's not incentive. They don't want that solution. Um, 
So we have to, again, come back to who's buying it and what are they buying. If they're buying efficiency, we sell lots of technology, the private sector continues to invest, and all is well. Yeah. How do you uh, address the problem of, okay, say you have an idea, it's worked for 100,000 people, you want to scale it up, you get the private capital, fine, you reach a million people in that country. Then you want to look at the next country, then you want to look at the country after that. How do you address the issues of the fact that no two countries are the same, and what challenges does that bring in to the idea of trying to innovate to scale? Let's get Anne May and Charles. Sure, um, I, I agree, and it depends on the type of innovation, but no two countries are the same. Um, and so with, with you know, just taking the off-grid example further, Right now, uh, what we're seeing is a lot of these um, off-grid household solar systems taking root in areas around East Africa and India, but not a lot of other um, geographies. So we're looking at trying to put together some funds to be that early stage risk capital, to test this out in some other areas. And there's going to be different challenges in, in different um, geographies. One of the reasons that off-grid is so successful in East Africa is because of the presence of mobile money um, being fairly well established there. And it's going to be much harder to be successful as a business in places where that isn't the case. But so that's just one example of how the conditions are different. So we as donors often we can't just test in one place and expect it to just scale. We'll, we're going to have to seed it in other locations as well. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to remember the other half of your question. If no two countries are the same, then do you have a kind of fundamental obstacle to kind of achieving scale? Yeah. So, so part of it is us being catalytic. And the other part, I, I totally agree with Charles, is that um, one of the things we're trying to do is get more data and get more data fast, right? Not this like two and a half years into a five year program, we start doing uh, an evaluation that takes a year. So, three and a half years in, we finally get some information about whether it works. We're trying to figure out how to build data systems in every step of the way. And the reason Silicon Valley is so innovative is that Silicon Valley companies get data every day about how their products are performing. They tweak their algorithms every day, and they see if they perform better. We need to figure out how to get that feedback loop in so that we're getting data from our customers that matter about whether something's working, because things also change in an existing environment. Like, we aren't working in static context. So whether you're going to a new context or working in an existing one, building in those feedback loops helps you continue to keep your fingers on the pulse of what's working and what's not and adapt your solutions and continue, even in a static environment, to dramatically improve our solutions. Because we shouldn't be um, happy that we found a solution, we did an evaluation, it works, let's just do this forever, which is a little bit what we do today with our programs. But we should be striving to, like, why, is, why aren't we setting the bar that we should be twice as effective two years from now as we are today? Why we should be we? doing that. Why aren't we? Why aren't we setting that bar? We, we should be. But why are we not? <laughs> She's trying. <laughs> I'd, I'd say two, two things. Um, f first of all, um, one of the great things about Give Directly um, is it turns out, thanks to Give Directly and in, in the amount of, of research and evaluations that it has helped uh, uh, be done in this area. Um, we're now pretty clear that money is a bit like vaccines in that it works everywhere. And the real reason pretty much everywhere that poor people are poor turns out to be that they don't have enough money. Who knew? Um, and when you give them money, they become less poor. It's a miracle. Uh, uh, but now we kind of know that. I mean, it's, it's something that we all routinely deny when we say, you know, oh, well, they're poor because they're lazy or they're poor because they're you know, badly educated or they're, they're poor for a bunch of reasons. I'm not saying education doesn't help and health doesn't help. All of these things help massively, and there's a huge role for innovation in improving health and education and so on. But honestly, give them money and it will really help. Um, and, and so we now know that, you know, in I can't remember how many evaluations there have been worldwide, but a bunch of them. So um, while I do think that uh, uh, country context really matters, it turns out for some final solutions, if you will, it doesn't matter that much. Giving money anywhere seems to really help with this problem. Now, the way you give that money uh, may vary by context because of mobile money being differently advanced. Um, so there are, there are still evaluations to be run. It's not on the success of the, the money part of the intervention. It's on other elements of the intervention. And that brings me to the other thing I wanted to say, which is there are multiple reasons why things succeed or fail. And we need to be very careful in our evaluations, not just to ask the question, did it work or didn't it? 
we really have to be asking why did it work and why didn't it? And actually that means before we design the evaluation, we have to have some theory about why it might work or why it might fail. And we need to be, you know, we can't do all of this in an elegantly randomized way that would turn into a randomized control trial that would occupy seven billion people. Um, but in, at least in as rigorous a way as we can, trying to work through, you know, it, did it fail for this reason? Did it fail for that reason? Did it succeed? Was it these six factors that were vital to a success or was it only these four? And we, we need to be thinking about that question from the very start um, you know, while we're running our evaluations and when we're thinking of scaling up in different environments. I completely agree. Um, you just agree with everyone. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is no fun. No, the thing I was going to say about Charles, we, we have a tendency in development to debate efficacy at the intervention level. Mm -hmm. Deworming versus cash, uh, which is a very strange thing at some level. Like, we don't sit around debating social networks versus search engines, do we? Like, Google kind of outcompeted Alta Vista, Facebook versus Friendster and others. And what that comes down to is the team and how well you actually execute. And I think rather than just debate at the intervention level, we need to ask who's the organization, who's the team, how good are they at scaling across countries? Because it's not just the intervention. Now, there are some interventions that are simpler and lend themselves to scale more easily like cash, and that should absolutely be part of the conversation. But I do think it needs to be a conversation about organization, team, and performance, and not just the intervention. And I just want to give a plug to what Michael's doing, because I think with his two companies, he's doing something that's very rare in the nonprofit for profit development world. So one is with um, Give Directly, really setting metrics for us to continue to raise that bar to your question earlier. How are we going to keep raising the bar? Give Directly is giving us a benchmark and saying, we're not just going to prove our things good. What we want to do is test ourselves against other people and see what's better, right? And continue to be competitive there. Because we're missing that element of competition in development mm -hmm. often in terms of who can be most cost effective in yielding results. So I think that's great on the Give Directly side. And then on the Segovia side, something that they're doing, which is also very rare in, in the um, development world, is they're building a platform. They're, bu they're building like world-class tools that multiple organizations can use versus what we often do, which is have each organization build their own bestoke tools. And I think both of these things are great steps forward in what I'd love to see more of in our industry. There's quite a love-in going on on the stage <laughs> today, isn't there? Um, which is a former journalist is a terrible thing. We try and in inject some disruption into the stage by opening up to questions from the audience. Uh, maybe they can rile you a little bit. Um, so what we'll do, we'll take two or three questions at a time. Uh, we have microphones going around. If I call on you, please, when the microphone comes, please stand up, say your name, your affiliation, uh, and I would encourage you to go straight to your question without meandering around the statement. Um, so let's start with this lady here. Uh, let's have this lady, and then let's have uh, Anita in the back over there for the first round of questions. Hi, I'm Abigail Woodward, and I don't have an affiliation, but I've worked in um, women's issues all my life. So I want to know if, what if your criteria for figuring out that something is working includes um, disempowering the current political elite, like patriarchy? Mm -hmm. mm. You jumped right in there, didn't you? <laughs> uh, this lady. Sure. Uh, hi, my name is Anna Pantelic. I work with Fundación Capital. And uh, we actually work with 14 governments um, throughout Latin America and in Africa. And I'm curious, you know, from your perspective, there's a lot of talk about um, the US government. But in terms of that relationship and that partnership with national governments, particularly some of what you were mentioning about um, interventions being designed for, uh, for sort of the donors and the governments, but not the end users, if you have any experiences of where that co-creation with national governments, not in the US, but in sort of the developing world um, that you could share, that'd be great. Thank you. And then Anit there. Anit Mukherjee from Center for Global Development. Uh, just injecting a little bit of uh, animosity, maybe. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm from India, and um, one of the um, innovation, innovative things, and I didn't think it was innovative, but when I came to DC, I found it was innovative, was the biometric ID uh, system that uh, has 1.02 billion people now. Um, the problem, I mean, the, we did exactly zero RCT on that. So it wouldn't have happened had we not understood the value proposition that there was a need. And we, no matter what our cities give us, we would still go ahead and do it because it just matters to the people, right? So that's, that's where also we got the scale. Uh, 
in some way that it's a billion people who are on, on that system. My question is, what are the other kind of value propositions that you are missing? For example, research says early childhood is huge. Um, are we waiting for our cities to give us directions on how to scale up early childhood programs, for example, through cash transfers or other? Um, there may be several others which I'm missing, but maybe some thoughts on that. OK, great. Thank you. Let's get some responses to those questions. First of all, uh, the first question, through a gender lens, uh, what happens when what you find works ends up disempowering elites, political elites, i.e. men? Uh, let's get a range of opinions. Anne May, would you like to kick off on that? Or <laughs> Sonal, experience of government as well? Well, um, our perspective is, is our aim is less to focus on disempowering anyone, but so much as to empower people who tend to be disempowered. So maybe flipping your question in reverse, you know, how do we empower women in a case, or, or other people who are disadvantaged populations? And I think that's another place where government and donor funding can really sort of point the private sector in places that they are not necessarily paying attention to. So for example, when it comes to access to mobile phones and the internet, women are about 14% less likely to have access to mobile phones, 23% less likely to have access to internet, which is sort of across the board in developing countries, but there's something people don't often realize is that there's almost twice as many men on the internet in Africa as women, and almost three times as many men on the internet as women in South Asia. Um, and so, you know, that creates an enormous disparity. And so things that we try to do as donors is to um, try to address that disparity. So we've worked with a number of different programs with the GSMA, with Intel, and so forth to try to bridge that gender gap. So for example, <coughs> working with um, private sector mobile phone companies to specifically market and design programs that are aimed towards women and really doing research and understanding that target population which they may not have understood before. And again, being in that case catalytic as a donor to encourage those companies to look at a target segment that they might not have looked at before and show how it can be a segment that would um, be profitable for them and, and be part of their business that they should value. So um, I think things like that are t types of interventions I think that are really important. Go ahead. I I'll say we don't do a very good job of it. Um, I think it's a bottom, it's a top down versus a bottom up approach. And if we keep doing the top down approach, which is what frankly we all have been talking about, it's never going to get there. We have to flip the model and say, what if we were to take the intervention and start with the women first, as opposed to starting with everyone first and then hoping that the women get to it? But what if you started and said, um, you know, let's go give a mobile phone to every woman? And I think Give Directly probably does this better than anybody, which is we'll just give cash. And the India program actually does this well. Everybody is on the biometric system. It's not you know, just start with the men and move with the women, and the cash transfers go directly to the women as equally. But I think we have to be much more intentional about inclusion and diversity, um, and we're not. It, we come to inclusion and diversity as a backwards moment after we're done with it. We're like, who was left out? As opposed to starting with the conversation of who's in first, um, and, as a, and, and not come in from the other side. So I think uh, we don't do a very good job of it. I don't think, um, I think women tend to be an after effect conversation as opposed to starting with that conversation first. Um, and, and we're too busy trying to test the proposition to, to the point that was being asked over there as opposed to saying, why don't we just start there and see what comes out of it? Because it might be worth testing just to say that's a better place to be than 52% of the population in the world. Um, this, is, this is what we're gonna do and we might fail. But frankly, we're failing already. So what's the alternative to failure? More failure? So it's still better than not trying. But we're so afraid of failure that we're not willing to try it until we test it 50 more times and saying, do we have a controlled environment that tells us this? But it's like, test it because we're failing. If 14%, only 14% of the women on mobile phones have failed. So what's the, what's the answer to that? And I think we need to come up with a better bottom-up way of doing that. I agreed with, with all of that. I, I, um, you can't innovations. Agree all the time. Sorry. Uh, well, <laughs> let me caveat then. Um, uh, uh, innovations that affect power relationships quite often fail because they affect power relationships, and the people in power don't particularly like them. Uh, so, uh, one case that doesn't particularly speak to gender, but uh, uh, you know, putting putting um, uh, timestamps in, uh, in cameras and uh, which timestamp when teachers arrived in schools. Uh, various places led to the cameras being bashed up by the teachers. Not surprisingly, they didn't like that. Um, so, you know, if, if you're going to muck with somebody's power, they're probably going to fight back. Cash transfers actually is an interesting example of that. I mean, I think with, in the Give Directly case, 
cash transfers actually, you say, led to a reduction in um, domestic violence within the household. In other cases and with conditional cash transfers, in some places we've seen the reverse result. And it <coughs> is, uh, you know, again, depending how the money came, the results seem to, to switch back and forth. And it seems, perhaps not surprisingly, to be terribly culturally specific. So I think this is an area where, I mean, you were saying, do we have to wait for 15 more studies? Please, God, no. But on the other hand, I think we do have to be careful um, that, that sometimes an intervention that works in order to help make this problem better in one place and you know, statistically significantly make the problem better in some places, in other places can have the opposite effect. And so you know, I, I, I hate the result more research needed. No, I don't. I love it. I work at a <laughs> Centre for Global Development. But anyway, um, more, more research may be needed, or at least some caution, not, not waiting on a RCT to appear in the AER, but, but at least some caution in, in, in design and rollout. Michael, just briefly before we move on to the next question, uh, you were about to speak then, weren't you? Anyway, I was going to ask you, maybe this is what you were going to say, uh, what's your experience? I mean, has your work, has your platform challenged traditional power structures? Yeah, and I, th I think a lot of development interventions run through multiple layers. And one of the last layers is often going to the village elder and last asking for a list of names, which is the way a fair bit of targeting still gets done. Uh, you can imagine... Uh, how that works more often than not. We, as GiveDirectly, don't. There are a lot of other programs that don't as well, so we're not, we're not unique in this. By going directly to the recipient and providing them a cap the capital, you're also, in many ways, providing them a vote and a voice. And we don't have the full RCT yet. Uh, we will um, on this. But we have a fair number of anecdotes where a local village elder or elite has actually been removed from office because they're asking for bribes for being selected for the Give Directly program. Now we've, we communicate regularly with the beneficiaries, we have phone um, call centers, so we're asking them, has anyone asked you for money? In a number of cases, the answer is yes, the village elder asked me for money as a thank you for being included in the list. I know you guys said you didn't use him to select the list, what should I do? Um, and in a number of cases, they've been removed. Oh, okay, let's move to the next question. Um, this was from this lady here. Uh, it was just examples, really, of where you've co-created interventions with national governments. And I think this is for you, this question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's absolutely critical that we work with national governments because if we've talked about they are one of the primary paths to scale. Um, you know, one example that we've done recently is in the aftermath of the Ebola crisis in West Africa. We've been working with WAHO, which I'm not sure what it stands for, but it's the West African Health, like it's all the West African health ministries, essentially. Um, and working with them to figure out how to have the health information systems in West Africa become interoperable from a data standpoint um, and how we can make that sustainable by getting them the right, um, building up the right technical expertise locally so that they will have the systems that can help track and um, predict tra disease trajectories, whether Ebola or otherwise. And that's not something we can just impose on these governments because too often we impose systems on the governments that nobody then can maintain or um, understand. But we need to really work with the systems that they have and the capacities that they have and build up the capacities locally to be able to do that. So that's just one example. But it, I think that it, um, we should be doing a lot more of that. Well, there's, so, there's so many examples of this from kind of the Kenyan cash programs, the HSMP, to some of the social programs in Uganda to Indonesia. And depending on the country, different donors and different multilaterals will have a different um, voice. Um, but there is a fair bit of co-creation, whether it's the World Bank, USA, DFID, or whatnot. The thing that's interesting in a lot of these cases is when you do pilot it and really roll it out in a district or some region before the government takes over full ownership, um, that's the room. That's the middle part of the donut that I keep talking about, which is between the innovation bucket and the fully government-owned bucket. And, and that's a place that we can have real impact. They call it the pioneer gap, right? Let's do that. I like that. <laughs> so the third question was from Anit about what are the other value propositions out there the, that you perhaps don't need to wait for RCTs on? You don't need to get any on that. You can just dive in and say, yeah, we know this is a good idea. We know this is going to work. This is a bit... Well, I mean, we know, I mean, if it's private, so if you think you're going to have a consumer who's willing to pay money for it, um, you don't need to wait on the RCT. You can wait on the market, if you will. Um, but even when it comes to government interventions, I mean, India decided to do Adar for our 
bunch of reasons, I'm sure, um, but a lot weren't. If, a lot of them weren't to do with is this going to have an economic rate of return of above ten percent, right? Um, and and governments are driven by a lot of other things than that. Um, I do think the more you get towards the sort of public good technologies, the more you want to have some sort of sorry public good innovations. The more you want to have some evidence that they they work before you roll them out, because the less you'll have any other test. Well, you know, it's interesting um, when the mobile phone, if you look back at the history of the mobile phone, for 10 years, the conversation was mobile phone was never going to beat landlines. 10 years of industry reports that the mobile phone would never get to 100 million people using it. Now, if we keep making bets that we overthink, I just challenge you for a second, we're never going to get to making bets. And I think to some extent, uh, I think your comment is that we have to make some bets. I would bet that the digital economy or digital going digital is going to be a very interesting bet for us to make. It's already happening because the private sector is moving in that direction. The question is, where is the development sector going to be in that space? Are we going to wait till it happens and then kind of get on board with it? Or are we going to wait? Are we going to be a part of it? And, and really figure out where inclusion and digital is going to become where the conversation is already happening. But no one is having an intentional conversation about where does inclusion come into that conversation and what does it look like if we could get, if we could use blockchain to get access to finance, to people, and do direct, um, you're already on and you could be on that chain. We're not having that conversation. In fact, the finance industry is having that conversation, but we're not having that conversation. So I think there are, in the digital space, I think there's a ton of opportunities to think and test, and I think the private sector will probably do it with you as opposed to waiting for the development sector to get there, uh, to be fair. But um, I think it requires us to think about where we want the future of social impact to go as opposed to spending our time trying to fix the problems as, as we see them, but where are they going and where do we want to see that future happening? But it's going to require some bets, and, and it required the government to make a bet in putting up mobile centers, because it was actually the government that funded it most of the time, uh, but the private sector went and delivered on it. But if you looked at those reports for the, from the mobile industry for a decade, for one full decade, we kept saying that mobile phone wasn't going anywhere because we were betting on the satellite, and, and also we bet on the satellite phone and not the mobile phone. We thought the satellite phone was where the world was going to go, and it ended up being where the mobile, where we went with the mobile phone. So, just we don't always get it right, but there's going to require some bets on this. And me. Yeah, and I would say um, I don't think I'm smart enough to know what to bet on. <laughs> um, you know, just to Sonal's point, you know, so f very few people are prescient enough to know what's going to be the next big thing. I think we all can hypothesize, but I don't think I'm smarter than anyone else in picking that. What I think is more important is that we create an enabling environment where we place lots of bets and we create the enabling conditions for the one that, ones that can flourish to flourish um, and allow them to play out. I mean, this is kind of how venture capitalists work, right? The, you know, these, the best venture capitalists that make millions of dollars and are presumably very smart and experienced, one out of 10 of their bets make actually it. makes it, right? And so they can't pick any better than that. I don't presume I can pick any better than that. And I think it's more complicated in the developing world. So um, I, think, I think of our job is really to place yeah. a lot of bets figure out how to place those bets as cheaply as possible and get results as quickly as possible, enable us to see those results. Um, and then that, that allows us to place more bets and see which ones are able to thrive. Because um, there's so many factors that allow something to really succeed that we just can't predict a priori. OK, let's pick up a few more questions. Wow. <laughs> OK. Uh, gentleman in the black over there, the gentleman on the front row over here. You had your hands up early, and then lady over here. Uh, Nagy Hanna, uh, uh, former World Bank uh, staff. Um, I find that the model of picking a promising intervention by a donor, or several bets for that matter, to be just one model. Uh, the danger of it, frankly, is that it is very tempting for the donors to do that because it gives them immediate feedback and visibility about that intervention. But it leaves the rest of the innovation ecosystem within the country untouched uh, or very marginally impacted. And it seems to me that for more development countries have a lot of R&D spending that's going nowhere or can be strengthened and improved on uh, public R&D institutions that can be oriented and linked more 
to the innovators and to the industry and the needs of society. The whole ecosystem within the country seems to be the one that mm. needs badly to be addressed. And unfortunately, by focusing on single interventions and single entrepreneurs and technologies, we may be undermining building that capacity for innovation within the country. That's a challenge I would like to hear an answer to. Thank you. OK, gentlemen. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, what is being tried to try and get people together in meetings to raise the money and set their objectives uh, using the internet or mobile phones so that there's more transparency and people can see what they're doing? OK, and then this lady here. Is that microphone on? Hello. No. Yeah. Hi, Hi, I'm Casey Selwyn. I work with CAI, a nonprofit public health organization. Um, so I'm curious. You were talking a lot about scaling, and then also about the um, idea of evaluating as you're going along in order to kind of pick up how things are going or how they're not going. And I was curious how you think about the process of implementation as separate from the innovation itself, and whether you consider how to innovate in that process and the ways in which these things are distributed or the interventions are um, take place in these different contexts. Okay, let's start with that question actually. How to innovate within implementation as opposed to just innovate in itself, is that right? Who'd like to start? I'll give a short answer. I, I don't think that they're separate. I mean, I think we artificially separate them in development often because of the way our, our programs are designed, but innovation is a, continual process, it's not a one-time process, and, and we should be innovating every step of the way. I, I don't think we have to separate, I think what we're talking about is that sometimes you're looking at performance evaluations on a constant, like are we performing, what are we performing to, are we getting there, and then there's the long-term evaluation of did the intended thing actually have the impact that we want, but they have to work simultaneously, you can't, you can't wait and start the other. I think, the, I think that's the whole point of data, is, to, is are we collecting the data to know what's happening and to be able to pivot when we need to, as opposed to wait um, to pivot if, we, if we're seeing something not working. But I think having better data systems would certainly help us do that on a more regular basis. I, I, I totally agree, and I, I, I think we, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a function of the funding structure where innovation is seen as the first step, and then yeah. you implement, and innovation is an outcome, yeah. uh, which I don't think it is. I think if we define what the outcome is, take the simplest example again of cash. How can you deliver cash the best, as cheapest and fastest to the poor? If there was a real reward for cutting the time spent in delivering cash and for, for increasing the efficiency, a lot of organizations would come in and compete for that money, and they'd find ways to innovate in delivering cash more effectively to the poor. So I think it comes back to the clarity of buying decision. Um, Clean innovation, I, I, just as, as I think about examples, you, you think about some of the great innovations, like flying, right? The Wright brothers didn't look at each other and say, let's innovate and let's form a partnership. That wasn't the goal. The goal was to fly. And they, they came up with the solution of a, of a plane. And I, I think we just need to think of it that way. So, I mean, just linked to that um, um, and to the national innovations systems point, um, the more donors can at least some, I think there, there, there is a, a, a space for the model that basically says innovators come to us and if we like your idea we'll help you pilot and scale it. But there is also a big place for donors to take big global problems that we know about, say this is the result we want, go innovate so we can get to it. This is a plug for CGD product number two, uh, um, uh, the, the advanced market commitment that led to the development of the pneumococcal uh, vaccine uh, funded by Gavi is an example of this. You know, to, to encourage innovators through prizes and such like mechanisms to innovate towards a solution to a known problem, um, I think is a, is a really important role. And those prizes ought to be open to everyone. Um, and quite often, I would hope, more and more, more often in the future, um, it was the case with the pneumococcal vaccine that very quickly developing country producers started producing the, the vaccine. I'd hope more and more it would be innovators in developing countries who'd win the prize. Let's get a, uh, the, gentle, the, the question at the front here uh, was about transparency. Uh, I must admit, I can't read my own shorthand now. So could you just summarize again what your question was? 
question is what can we try to get the internet into the meeting so people can put together their money using the internet in an orderly manner and have it transparent so everybody can see what people have done on the internet. So one thing I'll, I'll uh, plug is something we've been working on along with a number of um, our other partners is something called the Global Innovation Exchange that is working to get all the innovations for development in one place so everyone can see what they are, where they are taking place, what's, what, who's funding what, um, you know, so that both innovators can find each other and who they might want to collaborate with and funders can find <laughs> innovations that they may want to fund. And so um, we're hoping that that will be one way to bring more transparency to the process because right now everybody has their own little stable of innovations and nobody knows what everyone else is doing. Okay, we don't have a lot of time. I want to get a couple more questions in uh, before the time runs out. Um, it's only men with your hands up. I just noticed that. We're trying to get a bit more gender balance into these questions here, uh, people. Uh, okay, so we'll go gentleman in the red shirt and then woman at the back on the back row there. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Zach. I'm, from a, I'm a student at a startup university. Uh, I think so you know one of our employees, Mike Wang. Um, uh, we kind of mentioned, uh, well, academic says that diversity lends itself to kind of uh, optimal solutions way more than you know skill or intelligence um, and so do you have you seen any ideas or kind of MVPs of um, policies or platforms that allow kind of a democratization of, of ideation or feedback systems for for uh, global development hi my name is Alexis Bonnell I'm with USAID and this uh, question specifically cannot go to Ann May since she's my boss and I would get in uh. trouble <laughs> so everyone but Ann May can answer this um, no I mean one of the things we've noticed is just that our lives in the developed world so to speak really move toward a custom economy this idea of supply and demand and being able to be active customers and now in the developing world you have people who have a cell phone right so a woman in a village if she had Ann May's number or my number or any one of the numbers in here, they could say, I don't actually want this, I need this. And so in talking about the next 10 years, Sonal, and where this might go, what is the transition for us from a beneficiary to a customer? And what will that have to unstabilize in our current industry in order for that to happen? Okay, mm. that's a good question. Ann May, you're exempt from this. <laughs> Sonal, do you want to start? What's it, so, do you want to start the implications of this move from beneficiary to customer? Yeah, it's an interesting terminology question too, right? Because when we think about a beneficiary, it's a top-down methodology. When we think about a customer, the customer is usually in charge. When you think about kind of how the private sector operates, you want to do where the customers are. So it's an interesting also terminology question. Um, I actually think we need to spend more time paying attention to where are the customers and what do they want and what are they looking for. Um, what's been interesting, and I don't know, do you all watch the JP Morgan report and what JP Morgan's been doing in the United States? They're looking at credit card transaction data um, globally, and they're seeing what people are doing and where they're spending their money. It's actually very interesting insights into where, pe what do people want to spend on and where they spend the most of amount of money and time on. And it gives us a lot more insight into where people are. I think this is something that we could do it from an innovation and from a development perspective, is really understand where are the communities. Technology allows us to get a lot more information about where, we're not gonna get credit card information from, from developing countries, but we can get a lot of information if we were creative about thinking about where we can get that information, how do we get that feedback? But it really requires to this lady's uh, original question of intentionality, are we going to the places where we need to get the information or are we just getting it from whoever's online? And, and it matters to know that. And so let me give you the little anecdote just for fun on this. Um, when we were trying to crowdsource in what questions originally that President Obama should answer, we just put this idea out there is like, tell us what you want to ask the president. We had to run this test three times because the crowd of people that were online only wanted to know whether marijuana was legalized. Right, of all the problems, this is 2009, <laughs> of all the problems taking place in the world, that was the number one question that kept coming up. And what we had to learn in that is the people that are online all the time are a certain type of people that want to make sure they could vote their thing in. And you have to think intentionally about how you build that system that allows for that. But so understanding the citizen and where they are. I think citizen engagement and citizen engagement, um, civic engagement is going to be a big part of where the world is moving. So we are, we're going to have to know where where civics are and, and what people care about. And I also want to answer this one question from, you're at Minerva, aren't you? Yeah. Um, it, there are lots of ideations taking place that are global. I mean, if you look at the grand challenges out of Canada, if you look at there's lots of there's lots of open 
ideation that is taking place. Um, it requires a little bit of digging into the small platforms it's happening on. It's not always in government, but it is part of government. Actually, the Canadian one is the Grand Challenges, is a Canadian um, Grand Challenges. Actually, really interesting to look at um, what, what comes out of DOD and DARPA and ARPA-E in the United States is actually also very interesting. They're open challenges. So anyone can participate, and it's actually fairly transparent where, where those challenges are. I think the div stuff has actually been um, uh, more transparent. We, we have grand challenges, too. Right, you do have grand challenges, and it's transparent. So if you actually look at what's on there and participating, it, it's not as hard as you would think to participate in these, but to be to seeing what's happening and where people are coming from, I think there's some really interesting um, things that are happening. And, and I think prizes and challenges to the original question uh, this gentleman asked, are actually a really interesting way to bring in new people and new ideas. It may not get funded all the time, but you know, at least we get an idea of where people are and what they're thinking about. I think Gates Foundation has grand, don't they have grand they, challenges they as well? They started the grand challenges. Everyone's well. grand yeah. challenges. Someone needs to ideate it better than Well, you don't have to do grand. That's the point. It can be small challenges, right? It doesn't, <laughs> like the funny thing is that we always sound get, as to, impressive we get to this <laughs> point where we think the, it's got to be um, world changing in the first time around as opposed to what NASA used to do, which is we just want to change the glove that the, that the um, astronauts are using. And they got new materials from the glove by just doing that small of a grand challenge and learning from that and then seeing what other things they could challenge out there. But we, I think in development, we just overthink. It's like, how do we start small and build on small as opposed to trying to think about the greatest, grandest thing that we could potentially do? Okay. You're sitting in a think tank. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at a university. It's even worse. <laughs> um, I think that's probably a good place to stop the fact that we're all overthinking. Um, so on that point, uh, let me invite you, please, to thank our keynote speaker, Anne Mei Chang, and all our other panelists as well. Thank you very much.